So World War I is over, and uh, the Treaty of Versailles has been settled by most of the world. Not us. That's all right. Um, Woodrow Wilson is out of office, um, and we start with a whole new term. So, uh, the Red Scare. The Red Scare breaks out. There's two Red Scares in American history. We have one in the 20s, one in the 50s. Um, this is the first one, 1920s. Um, the United States is a very isolationist country at this point because we had just come out of World War I, and like any war that we've been involved in, we tend to go from looking broad and being very um, aggressive and imperialist in our views to looking very isolationist and narrow. We have sort of a myopia uh, about what is uh, important in the world, and we tend to concentrate on American needs, U.S. needs. We also had this growing fear of the Bolsheviks. Now, the Bolsheviks were the... A revolutionary group that took over Russia. Um, Lenin was in charge. He renames the uh, Russia the Soviet Union, USSR, um, and uh, he has Trotsky and Stalin as his sort of right hand right hand men. Um, but we were very scared of the Bolsheviks and the communists and the socialists coming over to America and making waves here and trying to start the same idea because that's what Marx had called for was this worldwide rev revolution. So we were nervous about that, and uh, there's this crackdown on the unions and this real, this real attempt to keep unions from forming because that was certainly a socialist idea. So, um, you know, according to the people at the time, and, and we didn't want that to happen. So we, we sort of kept a cap on unions, and the Attorney General at the time, in 1919, 1920, the Attorney General of the United States, A.G., um, Mitchell Palmer, he's going to lead a series of raids and he's going to round up over 600 suspected communists in the United States. And these Palmer raids, as they were called, rounded up a lot of innocent people in the process, as you might imagine. Um, he was pretty ruthless about the way that he went about it. Um, two of the people that are affected by this, this red scare are Niccolo Sacco and Bart Bartolomeo Vanzetti. So Sacco and Vanzetti, we heard of it as the Sacco and Vanzetti case. Um, they were from Massachusetts. Um, Sacco was a um, shoe seller. He sold women's and men's shoes. And Vanzetti was a fish peddler. Um, so two sort of different walks of life, but both blue collar. And they were accused of a murder. And they were accused, tried, convicted, and put to death before anything could really be done about an appeal. Um, and it was because the jury was um, a white pretty racist jury probably saw their names and went, I wonder where they're from, um, because their names are not exactly Smith or Jones. Um, and they were portrayed as anarchists. They were portrayed as um, anti-religious um, atheists. Uh, they were portrayed as communists. And so that sort of sets up the jury for a conviction. Um, they, they really didn't have a chance. Uh, and uh, there's a whole lot of doubt as to whether or not they actually committed that crime. Now, the KKK is also uh, making a resurgence here in the 1920s. In fact, in the 1920s, it would grow to its biggest size ever. Um, and the KKK was anti-everything. They used to just be anti-black, and that was bad enough, but now they are anti-black, they're anti-Catholic, they're anti-foreignism, they're anti-immigration, they're anti-prostitution, they're anti-alcohol, um, they're anti-union, they're anti-everything. They were truly, deeply, or they believed, truly, deeply fundamentalists. Um, they believed that they were the absolute moralists of our society. They were self-described as this. We certainly didn't, the general public did not label them this way. We saw them as, as bigots, as racists, um, because that's what they were. Um, and, but they saw themselves as moralists, that they were trying to bring morals back to society through lynchings and Jim Crow and um, bigotry, not moral. Um, by the mid-1920s, the KKK has over 5 million members that were dues-paying members. And each member had to pay $10 a year for their membership into the KKK. The question became, what's happening with all that money? And the government was sort of able to break them up because it looked like this was sort of racketeering. And the government didn't stand for it. And they were able to sort of make moves to, to 
break up at least the, the hugeness of the KKK in the 20s. Now, anti-foreignism was not something that was strictly restricted to the KKK. Anti-foreignism really existed among a lot of people in the United States, and there were some uh, changes in the law to try and dissuade people from immigrating to the United States. In 1920 and 21, you see 800,000 immigrants come to the United States. That's a huge number. Most of them, two-thirds, were from South and Eastern Europe. So you're talking the Balkan Peninsula, Greece, Croatia, um, Moldova, that area. You're also Serbs. Uh, you're talking about um, Italy. You're talking about Poland, um, Czech Republic, Hungary. So what Americans thought was, we're no longer getting the better class of Europeans. We're sort of getting their downtrodden. The people they don't want, they put on ships and they send to America. And that was sort of irritating to a lot of people, that we, that we weren't getting the best and brightest anymore. We were sort of getting the scrubs. Um, so there's a couple of laws that are passed in the 1920s. The first one in 1921 is the Emergency Quota Act. And it puts a quota on the number of people from every nationality that can come into America. And what it said was you can bring in 3% of whatever your total population was in America according to the census from 1910. So if you had 10,000 people here in 1910, you could bring 3% of that, 300, into the United States in any given year. Okay. Okay. The problem for Congress was that they thought they would be limiting immigration from South, Southern and Eastern Europe. But when you put the quota on the 1910 data statistics, it actually benefits Southern and Eastern Europe, and they were allowed to bring more people than Congress anticipated. So in 1924, they changed this legislation, and they passed the Immigration Act of 1924. The quota is cut from 3% to 2%, um, so that's going to bring down the number, and watch this, the census that was used for the baseline data was from 1890. That's a problem, because in 1890, prior to 1890, we had very few people here from Southern and Eastern Europe, so this really puts a limit on how many people from those areas that can come into the United States. Now, who benefits? Well... England benefits, Ireland benefits, Germany benefits, uh, France benefits, because those countries had more people here in 19, 1890. So they were able to bring in more people, but Southern and Eastern Europe had to bring in fewer people. Um, and this practically bans any Japanese immigrants, because the Japanese hadn't been here really at all prior to 1890. Um, so this is really a problem for, um, for the Japanese. You wonder why they hate us in 1941? Keep watching. Prohibition. Uh, prohibition was the ban of the sale, consumption, and manufacture of alcohol. Okay? Who pushes for it? Women in, women in churches. The, the, they really were involved in the temperance movement. It's a, it's a sort of a layover from the progressive era. Um, and they, so Congress finally passes the 18th Amendment to the Constitution. Uh, which is going to ban the sale, consumption, and manufacture of alcohol. Now, this is very popular in the Midwest, and it's very popular in the Bible Belt South, okay, where your fundamentalist religious people are. Okay? It's opposed, however, in the big eastern cities. I and mean, Think about this. New York, Boston, Washington. You're really going to ban people from those areas, Philadelphia, from drinking? Hello, St. Patrick's Day. Um, it, you know, the big eastern cities aren't real fond of this. They don't like this legislation at all. This is really going to handicap us. It's going to kill our tourism dollars. It's going to kill our bar dollars, our restaurant dollars. What are you doing? Um, when we rely on taxes from these things, too. It was a very idealistic law. People thought it could be enforced. They thought people would abide by the law. Not so much. People didn't abide by the law. They were looking for every opportunity to break the law, and the, the enforcement of this law was a joke. Um, it had no chance of succeeding at all because law enforcement simply could not, they did not have the resources to fully enforce this law. There was no way it was going to work. Okay? So what do we see with prohibition? Well, we saw a lot of people trying to get around it. 
um, trying to backdoor the use of alcohol. So what they do, they set up speakeasies. Now, a speakeasy was an under an underground bar. It was a bar that nobody really knew about. It was on the down low. Um, and the only people who knew about it were sort of the members. Uh, you had to have a password to get in. You were greeted at the door by some guy named Muggsy. And uh, he was dressed in a trench coat and, a, you know, a hat. Um, and uh, he would ask you for the password. And then you could enter. Cops were tr constantly trying to break up these speakeasies if they weren't getting a kickback from them. Um, and... There were a couple really famous ones in Allentown, in fact, a couple of uh, passageway from one side of the street where there's a theater and to the other side of the street where there used to be a speakeasy still exists, the underground tunnel. Um, so the um, speakeasies would have like their liquor all set up in their bar wells. And if the cops walked in, they could take those bar wells and hit a, um, and I'm talking like a bartender now, um, they could hit a button and the bar well would flip over so that it, the alcoholic bottles would disappear, um, and the cops would be none the wiser that uh, there's anything going on in here. Um, so speakeasies were, were interesting. They, they could be fun, I guess. Uh, you would blacken your windows out so you didn't have any light coming in. Nobody could see in the windows. Um, and uh, people really hung out and enjoyed themselves. A lot of politicians hung out in speakeasies, so this law, this prohibition law, was really tough to enforce when your politicians were signing prohibition on one side and drinking on the other. Um, so uh, interesting, uh, interesting time to be alive, I suppose. Um, now, how else did people get around it? Well, they brewed their alcohol at home. Um, they would set up home breweries, not very much unlike what we have today uh, with brewing our own wine, our own beer for home consumption. And you're not allowed to sell that stuff, but back in the day, they would brew at home. They would make bathtub gin, literally in the bathtubs. That's kind of gross to me. Um, and they would set up moonshine stills out in the woods. Now, we know from the History Channel that people still moonshine today. I don't know how some of these things wind up on the History Channel, honestly. But we know that there's still moonshiners today, and they still, um, they still rum, run their rum uh, from uh, the still to a uh, place where they can distribute it. They're still evading the law because why does the law want to crack down on moonshiners? Well, because they want the tax dollars from it. It's the same reason you can't run farm-grade fuel in your truck on the street um, when you can buy gasoline at a gas station and pay taxes on it. They want the taxes from this in order to, and to ensure its safety, of course, but um, as much as they can. Uh, but they wanted the taxes, and they still want the taxes, which is why they try to break up the moonshiners. So anyway, um, and we know that NASCAR got their start from the original rum runners uh, that used to pack up their cars, soup up their engines, and see how fast they could go to outrun the cops trying to catch them. Um, so, what are the positives from prohibition? Okay, we have all these negatives um, with you know law enforcement and everything else, and people evading the law. But what are the positives? Well, we saw a decrease in absenteeism from work. Fewer people were calling out of work because they were hungover or drunk. There were fewer accidents at work, especially in manufacturing facilities where you could you know cut off a hand. Um, we saw fewer accidents. We saw savings accounts actually go up. People had more money on hand because they weren't spending it at the bars or spending it at the liquor stores. So they had more money to put into their savings for their families. We also saw the abuse of women and children decline because men weren't, you know, tying one on at the bar and then going home and beating the crap out of their, out of their girlfriends or wives um, or their children. Um, so uh, that, um, all of those changes happen as a result. Now, um, we also see a rise in gangsters uh, during Prohibition because the name of the game became how much can we produce and sell and evade the law at the same time. And, and there were people who actually built crime organizations based on Prohibition. So who were they? Um, prohibition, we saw an increase in crime. We saw an increase in theft. We saw an increase in um, moonshining. We saw an increase in all sorts of crimes. But we also saw an increase in murder. Uh, and in Chicago, which was sort of the hub of organized crime trying to evade prohibition, we saw 500 people die in the 1920s, at least 500 people, um, through organized crime and uh, gangs, competing gangs, rival gangs competing over the turf uh, that they would distribute their liquor on. Um, 
one of the most famous, or the probably the most famous of the organized crime bosses was Scarface Al Capone. Why is he called Scarface? He's called Scarface because when he was a young man, probably 19 or 20 years old, uh, he was still living in Brooklyn, New York, and he wound up in some sort of fight brawl, and he wound up getting a scar on his cheek, a scar on his jaw, and a scar on his neck. Um, he had three different scars, and that's why they call him Scarface. Um, they, uh, people who knew him had other nicknames for him, the big guy or whatever, and uh, they, um, they had other nicknames. But Al Capone, Alfonso Capone, okay? Um, his most famous move, he, um, he sort of, he moves from Brooklyn to Chicago in haste because he, he beat up a rival gang member, um, and he basically beat this guy to a pulp. And the organized crime boss from New York, who was Irish, wanted Al Capone taken out. Now, he didn't know Al Capone's name. He only had a good description of him, but it was as good as a death warrant for Al Capone, so he had to leave town. So he moves to Chicago. He's a young man. He's in, like, his 20s when he gets to Chicago, and he starts this organized crime syndicate. Um, he's going to compete for all of the distributing territory in and around Chicago to distribute liquor uh, that he's going to get illegally and try and sell. He makes millions over the course of about six years. Now, his most famous uh, involvement criminally, um, although it was never proven, was the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where his gang rounded up opposing gang members, brought them into um, a sort of parking facility warehouse, and literally mowed them down with machine guns, or typewriters, as they were called back then, because of the sound that they made. Um, don't laugh at me. Um, the, uh, so the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, the cops pretty much knew, the FBI pretty much knew that it was Al Capone that was involved here. But they could never prove it, so he never went to jail for that. What does he go to jail for? Uh, tax evasion. They got him on tax evasion because he wasn't listing all of his income, because it was illegal, um, on his tax form, and they arrested him. They sent him out um, to Alcatraz to serve his time, and he spends... About a, um, he was sentenced to 11 years for tax evasion. He's released a few years early because he was getting really, really sick and they sort of figured he was going to die anyway. So they release him and he's able to go to um, his, he had an island mansion off the uh, coast of Florida and he was able to go to, um, I think it was Palm Island, uh, and he was able to go to Palm Island and spend the rest of his days there. He died uh, four days after his 48th birthday. Uh, so he's still a pretty young man. Um, anyway. The other issue in crime that we see at the time was Charles Lindbergh. Now, Lindbergh, of course, had flown across the Atlantic Ocean. He was a celebrated hero, aviator. Uh, he designed and helped build a plane, uh, all in an effort to win this $25,000 prize that was being given away for the first person that flew solo across the Atlantic. Now, was he the first person that flew solo? No, he wasn't. There was another guy before him, but because his flight wasn't recognized by the officials, he couldn't be recognized as the first guy. Kind of crazy, huh? Um, but Lindbergh, um, he designs and builds this plane. He takes off out of New York um, in the evening one night. It takes 33 and a half hours to fly across the Atlantic. Can you imagine a 33 and a half hour flight? Ugh! Um, he flies across the Atlantic. He finally, um, in fact, he was so low to some of the waves that he was only like maybe 10, 12 feet off the top of the ocean at some points. He runs into a hailstorm on the way over. He finally starts seeing boats, so he figures he's pretty close to land. He flies down close enough and yells out the window to the guy on the boat, hey, how close is land? Which way is Ireland? And the guy on the boat is so flabbergasted by what he sees, this plane in the middle of the sky, what the heck is this? Um, that... He doesn't know what to say. He, he basically cannot communicate with Lindbergh because he's stunned. Um, so Lindbergh finally flies across the southwest coast of Ireland, over England, and into Paris, where he circles the Eiffel Tower and lands. Okay, he's a hero. He's great. Anyway, why is crime associated with Lindbergh's name? Because of his baby. After his flight across the Atlantic, he and his wife have a baby boy, and that baby boy is kidnapped and murdered. They found the child dead um, after several days. The man that they arrest for this is a man named Bruno Hoffman. Now, he, Bruno Hoffman was an immigrant. He um, was married. Um, he was a young man. They said he did it for money. Um, and they immediately arrest him and put him in jail. Lickety split. Um, 
whether or not whether or not they got the right guy, we don't know. Now, the Lindbergh Law is passed, and the Lindbergh Law says that you cannot transport a child, kidnapped child, over state lines, or else it is a federal crime and can be prosecuted with a death penalty.